presentation of Sonia Bacci from the University College of London. Yes, the, the, your presentation is that ethnic residential segregation in European cities are welfare regimes making a difference? Please. Yes. <laughs> Please, Sonia. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, dear friend, I, I thought for today um, to organize the presentation with two, uh, two focus. Um, one is actually to work together through the old continent and um, provide a, just a glimpse about uh, differences and divergency, very divergent panorama within Western Europe, we're not talking about Eastern Europe, uh, by exploring the link between welfare and segregation, uh, in particular narrowing the focus on the housing system. Uh, I will draw on, on analysis that I did 10 years ago based on Christine Anderson and a lot of uh, Housing scholar, Kevin Marty, Bannon and Duncan, etc., where actually are looking upon how the different housing uh, system embodied in the welfare regime, and in Europe we have four different, or we have had four different welfare regimes, uh, are shaping and also reflecting a principle of stratification, social expression of stratification in the cities, and uh, how the mechanism of differentiation, which are part of the mechanism of the welfare and the housing system are actually influencing the pattern of segregation, particularly of the most vulnerable groups. Uh, this is a very comprehensive analysis. Uh, so I will not do the presentation explaining it is. There is a paper, so if you are curious and interested about that, um, you, can, you can have a look at the paper. What I want to do is something more interesting, which would uh, engage in this uh, debate about production inequality and the role that is played by the state market nexus in reality, as they say in housing studies, and to show you the contribution from an housing study perspective. It goes along the line, some of the line that being presented in these days, uh, but I noticed that the housing studies or housing perspectives uh, is being, uh, which is very complementary, it's not dominant, but it's complementary, it might actually be quite relevant for your debate. And I will do it from also a planning perspective, which is not to provide you with an argument, but a, a quest that is running around among some housing scholars in the last 20 years, and which is an open question, and which is, it is possible to rethink a decommodified housing system within a flexible regime of accommodation. And I explain where is this coming from, so uh, you can es uh, explain why I might just pick up on two major elements in, in this presentation to raise a debate and some thinking that goes beyond Europe. It's, it's more general about welfare systems. Well, there are several scholars in the housing, particularly those that have been working on comparative housing systems in the 90s based on Esping Anders' work. They say that the more the housing system is decommodified and they have in mind the social democratic welfare system, so the Scandinavian country in the Netherlands, as well as the cooperative system uh, of Central Europe, uh, France, Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, they say that the, the more the system was decommodified, the housing system decommodified, the more the state played a role in filtering, reducing social inequality. And it has a less socially and especially divisive society. Now, in the last 20 years, also from when it's explained in China, but also in Eastern Europe, and also in Europe, there was a process of recommodification of some of the housing systems. Uh, one of the major cases is the, the, the UK, which is the most dreadful case, and that they've been shown that this process of recommodification, also linked with the devolution process, has actually increased inequality in the European cities. And it's a major problem. Of course, the decommodification of the housing system was very much based on the Keynesian, Keynesian policies, full employment, social pact, we didn't afford this regime of open. Therefore, there is this enormous quest also among housing scholars as well as planners for different reasons in housing study scholars about whether we can rethink a decommodified housing system within, not for this, but within a flexible regime of accommodation. So along this presentation, well, I, I try also to show some relationship between welfare and segregation, I would like to draw you, you, to your attention to two things that are being fundamental and that they should be reconsidered again for this quest. One is the role that is played by what is called the unitary rental system, and which I will explain a little bit, and the other one is uh, the role of the land supply, and a more decommodified land supply, and a more public ownership of land, 
or negotiation of the climate system within them. Without actually addressing these two elements, it would be impossible almost to uh, follow this, this quest. So uh, I will organize the presentation on two, actually three parts, starting from segregation, uh, starting from the point that um, segregation is just a Trojan horse to discuss about inequality, concentration of uh, uh, and high level of uh, spatial concentration are not representative of high level of social exclusion. In fact, in many cities uh, in Europe, particularly in Southern Europe, we have a very dispersed, so very low index of segregation, also of particular ethnic groups, which is associated with a high level of social exclusion. And you can say also the reverse. So pattern of segregation doesn't tell us absolutely anything about it, but the mechanism of differentiation that they produce and organize this part of the process. It can tell us more about the scale, the nature, and the degree of uh, inequality of those people. So uh, I just leave you this uh, 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 diagrams where we can see uh, the degree of special concentration of the most vulnerable ethnic groups across the 30 European cities, uh, cross with the immigrant population, the size of the city, and you can see it's a very diversified uh, pictures and uh, perhaps we can't establish any relationship whatsoever, whatever theory of segregation you are employing. But if we actually were uh, looking at the city in question according to the welfare uh, regime where a national level where they belong, it seems that there is a relationship between welfare regime and a degree of spatial concentration. In reality, same ethnic groups are far more concentrated in the liberal welfare regime, like in London and UK and Belgium cities, and they are far more dispersed, for instance, in the opposite end, in the corporatist uh, regime, so France, Germany, etc., etc. The middle case is the social democratic, so the Netherlands and Sweden. And uh, even if we are looking at the residential geography, these elements corroborate uh, this relationship. This relationship can be looked within all the different pillars of the welfare, citizenship, uh, commodification, commodification of labor. One of the things that uh, I actually wanted to explore is actually to look at the housing system. Housing system are comprised by two elements, which is fundamental. One is the tenure policies, which influence the degree of social tenure differentiation. So it can tell us about uh, some social dimension of segregation. And on the other hand, on the housing supply, so production, promotion, and land supply, which tell us how this social inclusion or exclusionary uh, or more distributed social processes are organized across the territory. And it tells us about the spatial differentiation embedded in the housing system and produced within, within the cities. Uh, now, I also use, like to use a lot these diagrams because it challenges several, uh, I would say, um, assumptions. The first one is that we assume that owner occupation is a sign of affluence. In reality, here we have the wealth <laughs> of the, uh, the horizontal part, we have the wealth of the country in the mid of the 90s, and the percentage of owner occupation um, on the total of the housing stock. And in reality, the relationship is actually opposed. So the richest is the country, the largest is the rental sector, the poorest is the countries, and where we, we have also a lot of social insecurity, like the commodification of the labor market, etc. So that the higher is owner occupation. In fact, you can do the same across. Uh, international comparative analysis, and you will see this, this relationship. So, the explanation is not an economic one, it's a political one. And this is fundamental. And this is very important also in the debate that's been going on in the last 20 years, and especially the planning, and etc. Et the, the other second very, very, very important element is that uh, there is a relationship between also the type of welfare. Uh, so we have a social democratic welfare regime that a concept of society based on social partners which imply a very large a universal transfer across all, all groups and uh, which also imply to have a structure of the housing system that is highly commodified uh, which expand very largely the rental sector. But the most important element of this is the mechanism that allow higher redistribution through the housing system is what is called the unitary rental system. And here we see what is also the role of the social rental stock uh, uh, within this rental system. 
this unitary rental system is based on the fact that the social rental sector and the private rental sector are working in the same market. So the state encourages the social rental sector to compete with the private rental sector. The higher the quality of the social rental sector, the widespread access to all social groups or the, the, rental, the social rental sector, and uh, the accessibility, and so the cheap rent of the social rental sector influence an equal raise in quality, uh, cheap rent, and uh, a long-term tenure also in the private rental sector. So this allows a great accessibility and also affordability of both rental sector uh, for a large proportion of the population. This is a highly redistributive program, but also means that the social housing and large stock of social housing with good quality uh, is also being used to control the high rise of housing costs over the cost of living. So the issue of great affordability or unaffordability in the last 20 years is also depending on the fact that the social rental sector is being stigmatized and reduced and reduced, and it doesn't play anymore this role, apart from the fact that also it was playing a role of accommodating a large uh, cut across the social economy, particularly the middle classes. So the opposite in reality is, sorry, when we look at the welfare system that uh, have a very uh, poor universal transfer, so these are uh, residual transfer, which are typical of the liberal, where the conception of society is based on the in atomized individual, but also on the uh, southern European cases. This is more about the Catholic social policies that have decommodified education and health, but not housing, because it's produced and has to be produced by the family. And in these cases, uh, the policy and the technical policy within always portray in this uh, very uh, commodified housing system is to foster all occupation at all costs. And within the rental market, the states stigmatize and residualize the social rental uh, stock, which is also very small, in order to protect the speculative processes going on in the rental, uh, in the rental market. So uh, this is actually more evident on how the different welfare system are actually forge completely different housing system and also housing market if we look at uh, a city level. In this case, you can see, for instance, that in the Netherlands, Sweden, Denmark, uh, social democratic welfare clusters, more than 80% of the stock was rent. And of this, there was a primarily attention on the social rental stock. All occupation, very, very small. Similar things, but uh, with a slightly uh, twitch within the, the, the rental market, again unitary, is that we have a slight increase more uh, on, on the only occupation, but still more than 70% or 60% is the rental stock, of which dominated by the private rental sector. In these cases, there are other policies like uh, housing allowances, so the rental sector is also playing a social, very important social role. When we move to the liberal, um, there is a huge increase in only occupation. In this case, the UK uh, have a lot of social housing because this is the legacy of when the UK, uh, before the Thatcher, were actually producing an housing system very similar to the Social Democrats one. But in reality, the, the social renter, so the red one, is, is shrinking and it's being stigmatized and it's being marginalized and it's increased also in quality, especially and, and socially. And then we have the Southern European crisis, which is very typical of uh, and a system uh, fostering only occupation, and there are many different explanations which are very different also from the North European one. And imagine now that Madrid has 90% of only occupation with a rental stock of only 8%. You can't actually manage a city or allow the labor mobility within this, this situation. And also this, there is a relationship between the size of the only occupation and the housing costs, increasing housing costs or the cost of living. So this is also one of the elements of why we also have a huge problem of affordability uh, that is affecting the middle classes, the young population, and is not just a, a matter of uh, the most vulnerable part of the population. So in, in terms of thinking systemically, it's very useful. Now, this is just to show you how uh, the household are redistributed and how the unitary rental system has a very redistributive 
package, uh, if we look at the distribution of the household in the social rental sector. So in the northern European Sweden, uh, so the, this, the social democratic, but also the core party is, uh, the housing uh, rental sector part of the unitary rental system was accommodating a wide range, so you say that is a social tenure mix uh, distributed of uh, the income uh, echelons, particularly the middle classes. <coughs> and uh, in, instead of the list rental system, and if we include also the Southern European countries, will be the same, is just allocating to the most vulnerable part of the population, which is already provide a form of high differentiation and a higher level of inequality within part of the system. But there is uh, another element which is very important, which is a lesson that comes from some European countries up to the 90s. And this is how, <coughs> for a paradoxical way, the uh, owner occupation has been also playing an important role in the redistribution of the society within the territory, but it was based also on informal self-production um, of housing. Um, this is a way to show how um, only occupation among uh, Northern European countries has a high dominance of uh, high incomers, so they are predominantly dominant, while low-income people are is almost insignificant within this time. So only occupation in northern European countries uh, doesn't play a role of high distribution of society within the tenure. And the similar thing is also you look at the typology classical, these single family houses with a garden in the suburb, exactly the same thing. So the distance, the social distance that is created within this tenure is quite high in the northern European countries, but because of the percentage, the more percentage of these tenures, it becomes quite irrelevant. If we look at something Europe, this is extremely interesting because you can see that there is almost an equal distribution of all the uh, income echelons within this, this tenure. So owner occupation up to uh, the 90s uh, was actually playing a highly redistributive role across society. And uh, here is part of the explanation. In reality, this little house is with garden or single family house is uh, extremely dominant among low incomers and uh, smaller among uh, high income who prefer to live in flat, etc., etc., etc. Now, how this is explained? This is explained to the production. Uh, all for most of it, uh, or part of it, was an informal access to housing and access to land and self production uh, that then later on has been legalized. This was also a form of integration within the society of the migrants, for instance. Um, and, but also was um, a mechanism of uh, providing with the will of the state housing affordability. Now, after the liberalization of the banking system and also a greater control of the planning system, this type of production is not possible anymore. Therefore, again, only occupation now with a huge scale is operating exactly as in all the European countries with a far more unequal access because it's a monetary access, it's not a production anymore. So this, this type of distributive mechanism within the housing system in Southern Europe is completely disappearing. And it's becoming more and more, more and more important. Uh, now, another element which is very important that comes from um, this type of comparative housing studies is the relationship between the type of welfare system and the production side, which is very important and very often is overlooked. I don't want to enter into too much details because I want actually to focus uh, later on on something more important. But just to show you that, uh, thank you. Uh, one element that makes a huge difference in a more fragmented, scattered, uh, <coughs> spatial distribution of, of the groups is determined also by, by the production form and the size of the construction sector. But another important element you will read about this is the relationship between land supply, type of profit regime, and type of promotional form. It could be private, non-profit, family production, etc., etc., etc. Now, if we bring all of this together, there is something very important, and this is maybe the key to look for that quest. Uh, land supply, if we bring together uh, production and also tenure, we notice that land supply is a very common denominator. And what is very important, I will start from there, is that if uh, the commodified system 
is based on a unitary rental system. This is only possible when you also have a decommodified entrance of land within the housing production, which means that the majority of the land has to be either publicly owned or you have a strong um, power from the planning system, for instance, to negotiate uh, and uh, to create a, a more decommodified supply of land within, within the housing production. Without this, you can't have a housing uh, unitary rental system and a highly uh, redistributive system. The more we have a speculative land supply, for instance, the case of China is exactly this, so the more you are uh, also uh, selling land, public land, or recommodifying land, or create a planning system that is a laissez-faire market uh, system, so we have a more speculative land supply into the housing production, the more we can only produce a dualist rental system that is fostering owner occupation and increasing equality. And this has a lot to do also with the profit regime, uh, because in this case, the case of the Scandinavian countries, the only profit regime they can do is taking out of the equation land. So it's only on the quality of the production of the building rather than the whole chain of, of, of production. Um, this is the this is key. Now, just to come back to segregation, it was uh, that the diagram, the initial diagram, can be also explained in this way. If we look at the way of redistribution of the housing tenure arrangement uh, in terms of <coughs> unitary and dualist, we can see that these are the unitary are producing a less socially exclusive type of uh, uh, certification of society, while uh, the housing provision tell us more about the size uh, and the scale of production, the size of the uh, dimension of the spatial segregation. So in reality, we have four different cases in Europe uh, in which the corporatist and the liberalist, when you have a higher uh, dispersal of a particular vulnerable groups across the territory, which is also associated with lower level of social exclusion, and the opposite can be said the liberal, but we have the interesting elements of the Mediterranean uh, cities and also the social democratic, which tell us a, uh, a completely opposite way, which is in Mediterranean cities or Latin, uh, sorry, uh, Southern European cities, we have a very <coughs> dispersed, uh, with very low uh, level of segregation, spatial segregation of the most vulnerable group, uh, which are instead associated with high level of social exclusion. And the opposite can be said with the social democrats. So this is also is a way to disentangle a bit the social and spatial dimension uh, of segregation, the understanding the nature and the extent of segregation on one hand, uh, and on the other also to show how one of the pillar of the welfare system, in this case the housing system, can actually provide um, a very strong influence in the social and spatial division of the city and, and society. I think that. Thank you.